My name is Frank Sanders. I'm the head of the Telecommunications Theory Division at the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences, a laboratory of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, located in Boulder, Colorado. Over the past 30 years, we've developed a series of techniques for measuring emissions from various types of radio emitters. In particular, we've developed techniques for measuring emissions from radar transmitters. In this series of talks, I will begin by describing the fundamentals of RF measurement techniques, and I will culminate the series by describing our techniques for measuring emissions from radar systems, techniques that hopefully you can implement yourself. Accompanying this series of talks are notes available on our website and also NTIA reports that you may find useful. We hope that you will enjoy watching this series of videos as much as we've enjoyed producing them. Welcome to the 18th RF seminar in the ITS measurement seminar series. The topic of today's talk is RF radiation hazard calculations and measurements. And I'll start off by talking about the differences between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation, radiation so that we can understand uh, why when we're dealing with radio energy we're talking about a category called non-ionizing and why non-ionizing radiation hazard limits are set the way that they're set. For starters, we'll talk about how energy is transported through space. Energy is always transported either by waves or by particles or, or by entities that experience some kind of a wave-particle duality. So energy, which is the ability to do work, um, is transported through space. With essentially any of the uh, following mechanisms. Alpha particles, these names are historical. Alpha particles, which are helium nuclei, which consist of two protons and two uh, neutrons together, and they basically live forever. Beta radiation, beta particles, which are electrons, and by the way, in terms of stopping uh, power, alphas are stopped by paper, paper or cloth. Electrons are stopped by basically a thin sheet of aluminum. Uh, positrons, which are the antiparticle equivalents of betas, so they're positively charged electrons, positrons. They don't live long because they're annihilated. Uh, when they um, encounter matter, positively charged electrons. Uh, muons, and we'll mention muons a bit later, muons are basically heavy electrons, and muons live for about 2.2 microseconds, and they occur naturally in, in the environment. They're occurring right now in this room. We're all being bombarded by muons that are produced by cosmic ray energy hitting the Earth's upper atmosphere. Neutrons. Neutrons are interesting because they live forever inside an atomic nucleus, but they only live for about 14.8 minutes if they are not inside an atomic nucleus. So if they're free, they live for about 14.8 uh, 14 or so minutes, and they are stopped by anything that's loaded with a lot of hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen, with a lot of hydrogen atoms. Um, soap, a mixture of, of, of Baraxo and soap can stop neutrons. Protons, protons are basically uh, immortal. And high-energy proton uh, radiation can be very penetrating. Uh, 
fission fragments. These are chunks of atomic nuclei that come out of fission reactions. And I'll just say uh, assorted heavy nuclei. Protons live forever. They're known to live for more than 10 to the 36 years, although it's predicted that they should eventually decay. And fission fragments, heavy nuclei, are generally themselves unstable and prone to radioactive decay. And then, I think, and then finally we come to, uh, in a certain sense, today's topic, which are photons. Photons are, of course, massless. They travel at the speed of light, and they are immortal. They uh, live forever until, of course, they're absorbed. And um, photon energies, we'll talk about later, but photons can have a variety of energy levels. A variety of energy levels where the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant um, times the uh, uh, frequency of the radiation, or uh, h over 2 pi omega, which is equal to h bar omega, which is equal to uh, hc over lambda for, for any given photon. Now, the constant in here, Planck's constant, Board. We'll rewrite the equation. And by the way, I should have said uh, electromagnetic radiation that we're talking about, for example, with radio waves, of course, is always conveyed by photons. So the rule is that the energy conveyed by a photon is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the photon, uh, which is equal to h bar h over 2 pi omega, where omega is, is uh, frequency in uh, radians per second, is equal to h c over lambda, if you want to express it in terms of the wavelength of the radiation. And Planck's constant itself is equal to uh, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. It's also equal to we can write it in a number of different units. This is one that I find useful. 4.14 times 10 to the minus 15 electron volt seconds, where an electron volt, one electron volt, is equal to the energy that an electron, I'll write it this way, energy that an electron gains when accelerated through a potential of one volt. And um, it is equal to 1.6 approximately times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So these are the basic units. We'll, we'll be working here mainly with electron volts because chemical reactions are, are easily measured in electron volts. And uh, one other uh, set of units for this that I'll just note in passing is uh, Planck's constant is equal to 6.63 times 10 to the minus uh, 27 erg seconds, like so. Okay. So um, the photons that are carrying energy through space can, and, and in many cases eventually will, somehow or the other interact with matter. And when a photon interacts with matter, the photon will disappear and the outcomes could be basically threefold. The photon outcomes, number one, of course, in all cases, the photon gets absorbed. So when the photon is absorbed, it can either drive a chemical reaction, such as, for example, um, photosynthesis, 
Or, if it has enough energy, it can break a chemical bond as in, for example, DNA, or it can cause bulk heating, meaning, meaning that if you bombard a chunk of material like a turkey or a cup of water, you can, you can uh, heat the entire bulk of the material. So, so one of these outcomes is, is going to happen when when photons are absorbed in matter, like so. Now, um, go to the next board. It is an interesting fact that Energy thresholds, which are required, here we'll draw an energy threshold like this, where, where this is energy, and this is some kind of threshold for a reaction to occur, and this is basically state one before a reaction occurs and state two after a reaction occurs. It's an interesting fact that was explained by Albert Einstein in 1905 and for which he won a Nobel Prize in 1921 that if a set of photons are in an energy state which is below this threshold that needs to be achieved in order to either break a chemical bond or drive a chemical reaction that no matter how many photons you put into the system down here at a level that is below that threshold, that reaction will never occur. That chemical bond, for example, will never be broken. The intensity, the intensity, which is the um, uh, power flux flowing through space, can be arbitrarily high. But if not a single one of these photons has enough energy to achieve this critical threshold, then you are not going to uh, uh, cause this uh, transition. which is really a quantum transition, to occur. Cannot happen. And the uh, puzzling observation which he explained that had to do with the photoelectric effect where he said, yes, you can bathe a system in extremely intense radiation that has a long wavelength, a low frequency, where, um, remember energy is equal to h nu, is equal to hc over lambda, said you can bathe a system in a lot of photons that fall below this critical level, the transition will never occur. But if one photon or more with enough energy individually specified by this equation is able to interact with this system at or above this energy level E critical, then the system can go ahead and change states. So the critical thing to understand is that intensity of radiation when it comes to photons per se is not the most important thing in terms of wondering whether we can go from uh, state one to state two, but rather whether the photons have uh, enough energy to get through this, uh, this critical transition. Now, interestingly enough, chemical reaction thresholds, chemical reactions, generally involve generally involve uh, energy levels on the order of, that are on the order of one electron volt. It's no accident that when you buy a battery, the battery will produce a potential of one and a half electron volts, and then you can buy batteries that produce higher voltages, but you know how it goes. 1.5 electron volts, 1.5 volts, three volts, uh, maybe four and a half, but definitely six volts, nine volts, 12 volts, maybe 24 volts. Manufacturers are starting off always with a basic battery cell that generates one and a half volts of potential because the chemical reactions that they're using in the battery involve uh, a uh, energy transition of about one and a half electron volts and then they basically stack these cells up in series to get to three, six, nine, twelve, or twenty-four volts. 
So these are the these are the energy levels that are um, involved in these chemical transitions. By the way, just as an aside, nuclear reactions, which involve uh, interactions in uh, cellular uh, in um, atomic nuclei, nuclear reactions usually involve energy levels that are m more on the order of a hundred thousand electron volts to about a million electron volts. So nuclear reactions typically involve energy levels that are a hundred thousand to a million times higher than, than chemical reactions. Now, I said that we can either drive a chemical reaction with photons. This is what we're doing here with a battery. With batteries, we're driving chemical reactions. Same thing, same thing as I said holds for photosynthesis. Again, we're talking about energy levels on the order of about an electron volt. But the next step up is ionization. Ionization, which involves uh, shattering chemical bonds. And for the purpose of discussing radiation safety, what we're probably worried about are chemical bonds in DNA, RNA, maybe proteins. And the energy level that's required to ionize matter, is, uh, that is to ionize DNA and RNA, is about five. About five electron volts is required to break a DNA bond. You can bathe a system in photons that have less, individually, less energy than about five electron volts and they cannot break a DNA bond no matter how intense the radiation gets. But one photon with an energy of about five electron volts or more can break a DNA bond, an RNA bond, maybe, maybe, maybe a protein bond. So, don't mutations board, whatever. which could potentially cause mutations. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second also. So, so let's take a look at the numbers. And I provided a handout with today's talk where I actually go through the calculations, but, but we, can, um, we can basically say, so, energy to, to break a, uh, the critical threshold to break a DNA bond, we'll say is equal to 5 electron volts. That's equal to uh, HC over lambda, so we can rewrite that as lambda critical, here's lambda critical, some critical wavelength, lambda critical then uh, has to be equal to um, uh, HC over E, HC over this E critical, which is HC over 5 electron volts, and we can use the value of uh, H equals 4.14 times 10 to the minus 15 electron volt, uh, what are my units? Electron volt seconds, right? Just want to make sure of that. Uh, yeah, electron volt seconds. And of course C is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second approximately. And when we calculate that out, what we find is that this um, critical lambda is equal to about 2.5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, that's equal to 2.5 times 10 to the uh, 3 angstroms. An angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters, so that's equal to 2,500 angstroms. And then here's a, here's a uh, nice way that I have of remembering what the uh, photon spectrum looks like. I remember that red is base, red light basically has a wavelength that's equal to uh, 6,000 angstroms. That's for its wavelength. And green light is on the order of 5,000 angstroms. And blue light is on the order of about 4,000 angstroms. And then we have violet above that, and then we have ultraviolet above that, and it turns out that 2,500 angstroms is up in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. So if you walk outside on a sunny day and you're being exposed to sunlight, 
the red photons, the green photons, the blue photons, they have enough energy to drive a chemical reaction because at five at five thousand angstroms, for example, at green light, we do have enough energy to drive photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, but not enough energy yet to break the DNA bonds. But by the time we get up to 2,500 angstroms, five electron volts per <coughs> equals 5 electron volts per photon above the violet, in the ultraviolet. Now we have enough energy to ionize um, our body tissues and we get sunburned. And a sunburn is a radiation burn and it is not a good idea to, I to ionize the material in your skin. And so that is why, of course, people should wear sunscreen. Now, here's an interesting aside, and I, and I included it in the notes. Uh, I mentioned muons earlier. Muons are basically heavy electrons. Muons come into being because cosmic rays, cosmic rays in space, which are about 90% protons in terms, in terms of population and roughly 9% alphas, and which are generated by a variety of mechanisms and which have energy levels that are on the order of uh, a billion electron volts or more. Cosmic rays encounter matter in the Earth's upper atmosphere um, and they produce out of these interactions in the Earth's upper atmosphere showers of particles that travel down toward the Earth's surface including, including muons including muons, which we said have about a 2.2 microsecond um, half-life, meaning that half of them decay within 2.2 microseconds and half of the remainder decay in the next 2.2 microseconds and on down the line, half-life. And by the way, if you look at how fast they move versus 2.2 microseconds, you will compute that they cannot live long enough to reach the Earth's surface. And yet they do, in large, copious numbers. The reason is that they experience relativistic time dilation. And so time runs more slowly for their muon clocks because they're traveling close to the speed of light. They do live long enough to reach the Earth's surface. And I actually did an experiment years ago in which we were running a detector that had about the same density and the same uh, diameter and the, and the same thickness as the palm of a human hand. And we got about one muon decay per second in that detector. Now, mu now these muons have energies that are well above five electron volts. So these muons do in fact cause um, DNA and RNA and protein bonds to be broken, we can assume. And so I calculated human body volume, human body volume divided by the volume of the palm of my hand And I came up with a ratio of, I think, 350. Just check the number here. It's in the notes. Uh, yeah, 350. So the volume of my body is about 350 times the volume of my palm. Given that the palm of my hand is experiencing about one muon decay per second, and you don't have to go outside to have that happen. That'll happen in a building like this. I, I did the experiment in a, in a physics lab, which was inside a building like this. We can assume that we're getting about 350 muon decays muon decays per second in our bodies every second of every hour of every day of every year that we live. That's scary. Yeah, and so, and we can assume that a large number of those, probably most of them, are, are somehow or another breaking, breaking, a, breaking a molecular bond. And so again, working through the numbers, we basically get about um, 350 muon decays per second. Yeah, 30 million muon decays per year in your body, 300 million decays per decade, about 1.8 billion decays, muon decays in your body by the time you're 60 years old, if, if you live that long. So, so we figure 1.8 billion muon decays uh, in your body by the time you're 60, at age 60, at, at, at 60 years of age, and 
on this basis, it's probably safe to assume or infer that the body has a fairly effective mechanism for repairing RNA, DNA, protein damage. It's not perfect. Mutations, cancers can occur as a result of this, but if every decay resulted in a cancer, nobody would live for any amount of time at all. So, um, just something to note in passing that although ionizing radiation is not something that is desirable to be exposed to, the human body and plants and other animals do have some capability to, to deal with ionizing radiation. Basically, probably I'm guessing because we've evolved with this as an environmental background for the last, oh, four and a half billion years. But again, just something to note in passing, I think. Now, given that ionizing, the threshold for ionizing radiation, to get back to the main topic of the talk, given that the threshold for ionizing radiation occurs here at the threshold of the ultraviolet, where do we have radio waves in this spectrum? Well, radio waves, of course, are uh, below the infrared and are below the millimeter wave part of the spectrum in terms of energy, where this is high energy, medium energy, lower energy. Radio waves, radio waves are, radio waves are down here. And um, I'll go to the next board at this point. Write down some numbers. A radio wave photon at 10 gigahertz radio wave photon here's frequency here's energy per photon from the Planck relationship We'll do this for 10 gigahertz, 1 gigahertz, 100 megahertz. Works out at, excuse me while I check the notes. Again, I did the numbers in advance just so we wouldn't have to waste time with it and talk. Uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 5 electron volts per photon. And then, of course, this just goes 4 times 10 to the minus 6 and 4 times 10 to the minus 7 electron volts per photon. Well below the threshold required to either conduct a chemical reaction or the threshold required to break DNA, RNA, protein bonds. So, what can these, what can these photons do? They can, as far as we know, only do one thing to tissue or any other matter, and that is they can cause bulk heating. And the bulk heating occurs in water, for example, because the water molecule, which is uh, H2O, so we'll draw the oxygen looking like this, and we'll draw the um, two hydrogens on here looking like this. Here's hydrogen, here's hydrogen, and there's the big oxygen attached has a non-zero dipole moment due to this asymmetry in the construction of the molecule and the interaction of water molecules with radio wave radiation at, for example, 900 megahertz or at, for example, 2.5 gigahertz basically causes an oscillation to occur, mechanical oscillation to occur among the water molecules, thus causing bulk heating of the water. The radiation is absorbed by the water, bulk heating occurs. So as far as we know, this is the physical mechanism by which radio waves interact with matter. And when we're designing, or, or when researchers uh, design radiation hazard limits, the basis for those limits, and this is in page three of your notes, the basis for the limits is that we assume that we are not dealing with ionizing effects at all with radio waves, but rather that what we have to worry about is the incident power, which is energy per unit time, power per unit area that is incident into uh, human body tissue. And electromagnetically 
speaking, the human body is basically a bag of salt water. And one researcher told me once that a sack of potatoes is an excellent stand-in for the human body in terms of its absorption properties for electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation. I can't vouch for that personally. But basically, we're looking at human exposure in terms of power per unit area that can cause bulk heating into a 150 or so pound bag of salt water. And we're trying to obviously minimize the amount of heating that occurs there are concerns about whether the uh, body is able to effectively or efficiently dissipate heat if it's being generated in the core of the human body. If you step out on a hot day and you're exposed to the sun, you can cool the uh, exterior of your body and you can cool the blood inside your body because you'll sweat. The water comes out on your skin, the water evaporates off, it cools the skin, and the blood flowing in the capillaries just under the skin then ex and undergoes a heat exchange. In, in principle, if you're being heated at the core of your body, you can't efficiently get rid of that heat. Or if your brain is being heated, you can't efficiently get rid of it. So, so that's the, the um, uh, basis of Rad has limits, and that is the um, physical effect or physical phenomenon, bulk heating, which we're trying to minimize. So I'll make a note of it here. So Rad has for RF is intended to minimize bulk heating of the body. And by the way, um, most radio radiation is fairly penetrating. So most radio radiation can penetrate into and completely through the human body fairly effectively. So again, this, this bulk heating phenomenon is something that we're not just concerned about at the skin, it's something that we're concerned about in the core of the human body. Now, a lot of research has gone into the problem over the years of ascertaining what these limits ought to be, and I'm not going to review the limits themselves in detail in this talk because there are basically a lot of limits, um, let's say, of the body, human body, we understand. But I will cite the uh, source references that are commonly, probably almost exclusively used in the United States uh, when it comes to ascertaining the limits for radiation hazard exposure to radio frequency, which is again, just to emphasize it, which again is non-ionizing radiation. By the way, there are a whole separate set of limits for ionizing radiation, proton radiation, neutron radiation, beta radiation, and so forth, but again, we're not worrying about that here. So the source references are, in no particular order of preference, the American National Standards Institute, document number C95.1. This is a copyrighted document. You have to pay money to ANSI to get a copy of the document. For use here at ITS, I happen to have a copy, if we ever need to look at one. And uh, the title of the document, I'll just read it, I won't write it, is IEEE Standard for Safety Levels with Respect to Human Exposure to Radio Frequency Electromagnetic Fields, 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. And this specifies exposure for human beings, and it specifies it as a function of frequency, and it specifies it as a function of whether the exposure is under an occupational circumstance in a controlled environment versus non-occupational um, non-occupational uh, exposure in a um, non-controlled environment. The difference between, for example, experiencing it in a laboratory or a microwave production uh, hardware factory versus maybe experiencing it at a shopping mall or, or in some other public venue. Another, another uh, source reference is FCC, Office of Engineering Technology, OET, Bulletin, uh, check it here, Bulletin 65, Supplement C. Supplement C. This document, I'll separate that out a little bit. This document is especially tailored to the needs of the communications, or I should say telecommunications 
industry. And this document contains not only rad has limits, but methodologies that are recommended, but not required, but not required for measuring the radiation. They have some recommendations. They uh, do not necessarily uh, require that. And the title of this document is uh, Evaluating Compliance with FCC Guidelines for Human Exposure to Radiofrequency Electromagnetic Fields, full colon, Additional Information for Evaluating Compliance of Mobile and Portable Devices with FCC Limits for Human Exposure to Radiofrequency Emissions. As I say, it's tailored to the needs of the, uh, of the uh, telecom industry. And then third, and last in this particular listing, is the U.S. Department of Defense, U.S. DOD, MIL standard, military standard, 461. And MIL standard 461 deals with prevention of RF interference, prevention of interference between RF systems, but it also deals with limits for exposure, exposure limits for ordnance, ammunition, fuel, and personnel. And there are different and separate, there are different there are different and separate limits for exposure uh, of RF radiation to ordnance, fuel, and personnel. And these are uh, referred to as, and I'll bring, the, I'll bring a line up over here, HERO, um, HERF, and HERP. HERO is um, hazards of electromagnetic radiation to ordnance. HERF is hazards of electromagnetic radiation to fuel and hazards of electromagnetic radiation for personnel. HERO, HERF, and HERP. And as I said, there are different limits for these exposures. In some cases, and in fact possibly in all cases, the limits for exposure of RF radiation to ordnance and fuel are actually somewhat lower than exposure for radiation to people. In other words, they're more conservative in terms of not wanting to expose ordnance or fuel to the radiation than, than they necessarily are for people. In the handout, I have some examples of these. I'm just going to draw one of them here on the board as a, and not draw it particularly accurately as an example of what these limits look like. Typically, typically but not always, and you need to read the documentation for any specific case, typically but not always the limits are for average radiation exposure in terms of incident radiation power, milliwatts, per unit area, per square centimeter, usually averaged over some time period, but not always. There are some limits in some of the standards under certain circumstances for peak exposure, but not always. Um, and again, you will need to check a particular reference for a particular case that you're worried about, but power, which is energy per unit time itself, power per unit area impinging on a body or ordnance or fuel, and typically these graphs basically look like this. They're plotted, they're plotted in log-log terms where we have um, the incident power level in milliwatts, milliwatts per square centimeter plotted here in log terms. Start at 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3, and so forth log scale here versus frequency also in log scale where the frequency might be listed in megahertz and where we might start off at for example a uh, tenth of a megahertz and then one megahertz and then 10 megahertz 100 megahertz a thousand megahertz and so forth on up um, 10,000 megahertz, 
And we have curves that might, for example, look like this for Hero, and these are no particular, no particular levels that I'm drawing at this point, but show you, give you the flavor of what it might look like. And this might be the Hero curve, the limit for exposure of radiation to ordnance versus the, let's say, the uh, ANSI curve for occupational exposure of human beings to the radiation, which might look like this. I assume by occupational, you're constantly exposed to it. Or... Uh, just as part of your job. Okay. You're allowed to be exposed to higher levels. Generally speaking, I believe, based on what I've read, you're allowed to be exposed to higher levels if you're working with the stuff than if you're a casual passerby for whatever reason. There we go. And this might be, in effect, the uh, either the um, personnel limit HERP, or this might be the ANSI C.95 limit. These, these curves I'm drawing here are just drawn arbitrarily just to give a flavor for what these things look like. It has occurred to me that if a person is in fact doing a study on radiation exposure, they need to look at probably all three of the documents that I cited and decide which of the documents is the one that should be used for whatever particular situation a person's worried about depending upon the um, environment that you're, that you're working with. Sometimes you, a person might want to particularly refer to the ANSI limit another time. Uh, a person might feel that it's better to refer to the FCC OET document. Uh, if you're w working with Department of uh, Defense situations, maybe MIL standard 461, but, um, but uh, you have to interpret the individual uh, case or situation for that. Now, any questions on that so far? The radio radiation is non-ionizing. Non we're, we're worried about bulk heating. We want to minimize it, keep it below a certain level, and that these are good references to use. This reference is copyrighted. You pay money for it. Um, these references are public domain. You can download them directly um, off the Internet. Are there any IEEE standards in that area, Frank? I'm, I'm not aware of any. I believe that IEEE would refer back to ANSI because the ANSI document actually is titled and does refer back to the uh, IEEE. Some of those you can download off IEEE Explore, you know, because of our access through the Institute. I think. Oh, right. If you have professional access to IEEE, yes. Yeah, C.95.1, C the ANSI document, is in fact titled IEEE Standard for Safety Levels for RF Radiation okay. Exposure, right? Okay. So if you've got access via your professional membership or whatever, or subs uh, subscription, then you, can, then you can certainly do that. Okay, now, so... We come to it. Now that we know what it is that we're trying to measure, how can we do it? How can we do it? Um, in this, in the set of lecture notes that I have here today, I've worked out a number of um, a number of examples, and I'll just go through these rather briefly. EIR, EIRP, effective isotropic radiated power, for a system is going to be equal to the power density um, at some point in space, rho, multiplied by 4 pi r squared, where we assume that this energy is originating at some um, point in space and is moving out and is dissipating as 1 over r squared just because of geometry. Uh, the units of rho are power per unit area. r, of course, is just distance. And R is, uh, in fact, the distance between the uh, transmitter antenna and, and the point where this um, power density is being assessed. And when we have a radiation hazard limit, what we have is a critical EIRP limit that we don't want the transmitter presumably to exceed, which itself will have to be equal to the maximum power density that the limit is going to allow at some point in space, and then that's going to occur at some critical distance from the transmitter, r squared critical. So basically, we can take a basic equation and convert the equation into terms of the critical limit, which, we, which uh, is a maximum limit, which we find in, in, in one or more of these documentation sources uh, that we've got. Now, the EIRP itself is equal to the gain, 
and by the way, these are all linear units in these equations right now. I'm writing these as, as linear systems, not as, not as decibel units. The gain of the transmitter multiplied by the transmitter power is in fact the EIRP, and so again we'll put a we'll put a critical under that, whatever that critical limit it is, is equal to this maximum power density times four pi r squared critical, whatever that is. And so we can work this out um, for a variety of examples, and I've got one worked out here in the notes. We'll take a case, for example, where people are, and, and I'm reading from my own notes that I wrote here, people are sensitive objects, have to be able to come as close as 12 meters. We'll say, I like to just work this with examples. We'll say as close as 12 meters, so R is equal to 12 meters, uh, to some transmitter, and the transmitter has an antenna with, with a gain factor of 10, so the gain factor linear is 10. Um, and this is the gain in the direction from which people may be approaching. And the critical rad has power density, and I picked this number out of thin air, there's no particular limit for any particular criterion, happens to be 30 watts per square meter. So the maximum or critical is 30 watts per square meter. So people may come into 12 meters distance. We're not trying, we're, we're not going to allow the uh, power density to exceed 30 watts per square meter at that distance. We have a gain factor of 10 on the antenna. And so what we need to know is what would the, what would the critical transmitter power be? What's the upper limit to the transmitter power that we could produce then for those people who have to come to, into within 12 meters? And the answer here would turn out to be uh, 5.4 kilowatts. So that's a fairly straightforward way of uh, doing the uh, calculation. If we want to measure to verify, then what we need to do is set up a measurement antenna, which might look something like this, at some point in space, run it into either a power meter or a spectrum analyzer, make the measurement in appropriate bandwidth with an appropriate detector, like for example RMS average, and in many cases it's assumed that the radiation coming out of a source is a carrier wave, is a high duty cycle rather than a pulsed emission like out of a radar. And in principle we could set this up at a distance of 12 meters, if, if that were our critical distance, uh, from whatever the transmit antenna is, and here we have the transmitter hooked up to the antenna, this pin is dying on me, I guess I'll have to get rid of it. Transmitter over here. And we could actually measure and see whether or not we're exceeding 5.4 kilowatts. We should be able to calculate all this, um, uh, but we can always measure to verify that it really is at or, at or below. Um, well, we, we could measure this coming out of the transmitter. We can also measure in space, I should say, measure in space to see whether we're complying with this uh, power density right here at, at the antenna at a 12 meter distance away. So, um, just move on with a couple of other examples that are worked. Oh, I should mention in passing, one critical factor to consider if we're doing rad has measurements is that we do need to know what the gain of the measurement antenna is. Because it's the gain, of, just to recap from an earlier talk, if power is flowing in an electromagnetic wave through space, and that power impinges on some antenna being used to perform a measurement, and we're then doing the measurement in some kind of a power meter, which could include a spectrum analyzer, the way that we convert the power density in space, rho, the power density, to the power that we're measuring in the circuit, in the measurement circuit, which I'm going to represent as a, as a dial with a needle that can move, is to know either the antenna correction factor or, alternatively, the gain of the measurement antenna. In other words, we, we, we can never really measure the power density flowing in space directly. What we do measure is, in effect, a voltage in a circuit, 
and we have to be able to convert this voltage back to this incident power density right here at the antenna. And the way that we do that is to know what the antenna correction factor or the gain of the measurement antenna is. If we know it, great. If we don't know it or it's known, not known very accurately, then we can't get a very accurate power density measurement in space. So typically, uh, good antennas come with a calibration curve that includes this information. They can also be calibrated on an antenna range, like for example, the NIST antenna range. But, um, but that needs to be known if we're going to actually verify, because we're going to have to convert. Oh, uh, let's see. I'm going to uh, just really consider um, uh, one more problem here. Um, we've got more more uh, in the handout, but I'm going to consider um, one more problem. And I think what I want to do is consider... I'm going to go to uh, page 9 and consider a case where a rad has limit for members of the general public is set at 10 watts per square meter for frequencies between 2,000 megahertz to 100 gigahertz. And by the way, this is one of the actual ANSI limits from reference number 1. So from, from uh, 2 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz, members of the general public are not recommended for exposure that exceeds 10 watts per square meter. So we'll take 10 watts per square meter. Exposure limit so that we don't cook these people without their knowing it anyway. And we want to verify that the limit's being met. The problem is to verify that we're meeting this limit. And we're going to do this with a measurement antenna with a gain of 3 dBi. This goes back to the diagram I just drew. We have to know that antenna gain relative to isotropic, or we could know it relative to a dipole and then use the fact that a dipole gain is 2.1 dB nominally above isotropic. But in any event, we have to know that gain. Measurement antenna gain. Antenna gain. We'll say is equal to 3 dBi, which is not an unrealistic number for a lot of antennas, and we'll say that we're going to worry about this exposure at a particular frequency, which will be 5,700 megahertz, because I just said that the ANSI limit specifies this exposure limit for members of the general public uh, between 2 uh, gigahertz to 100 gigahertz. And so now what we want to know is what would the critical power level be that we would measure with the antenna connected to a spectrum analyzer where we would be exceeding this level. We want to look at a spectrum analyzer and say, okay, if we see more than a particular level on the spectrum analyzer with a 3 dBi gain antenna, that means that we're exceeding 10 watts per square meter exposure limit. And so uh, we have the math presented in the, um, in the uh, talk notes, but the uh, me uh, critical measured power limit here is going to be, uh, it turns out, 68.5 dB minus 75 dB. Actually, I might want to go back and do a quick derivation on this. Uh, plus 3, plus, and this is the antenna gain that we just cited, uh, plus 10 log of 10 watts per square meter. which would turn out to be equal to plus 6.5 dBm. So if we measure more than 6.5 dBm. Now, how did I uh, get the uh, numbers for, um, for the constants here? We've actually talked about this in one of the earlier talks in the series, but the uh, numbers come out of 20 log of the frequency in megahertz, where this comes from the definition of, of the effective aperture of an isotropic antenna, which is equal to um, uh, lambda squared over 4 pi times whatever the gain of the antenna is in linear units. That's where this term originates. Again, gain to the measurement antenna. This is the uh, field strength limit. And this number is a collection of constants 
including the speed, including but not limited to the speed of light c constants, um, all collected together into one unit and with ten log taken of that collection of that collection of physical constants. And again, the details are in the are in the talk notes, and we're basically running out of time for this talk, so I'm not going to go through all of it. But the derivations are in here. Nick Domenko here at ITS, I'd like to thank you, Nick, for having uh, read through these notes and verified them before I gave them today. So according according to Nick, these these numbers are correct. But the fundamental thing that I wanted people to carry away from this is that, that these are the kinds of problems that are, are easy to work out if you use the derivation in, that I've got in the notes, and if you know the gain of the measurement antenna at a particular frequency, then you can verify whether or not particular exposure limits are being met, and that the exposure limits themselves are available in these source documents for ordnance, fuel, or personnel, occupational versus non-occupational exposure, etc., and that uh, radio waves won't break your molecular bonds, they will only heat them. Not necessarily a good thing, but it could be worse. I'll sleep better. Though. Yeah, just think about all the muons you're being exposed to instead of the radio. I'll sleep over yeah. That any any particular questions at this point? Okay. Well, uh, thanks for sitting in on talk number eighteen. We've got two to go.